looking at a passage coming from Nehemiah chapter 8. I'll be reading verses 1 through 3 and verse 9. It's Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, and we'll look at verse 9. All of you who are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women, and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And verse 9 says, And Nehemiah, which is the Tirsta, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. You may be seated. Verse 9 says, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. This morning, I'd like for you to look at the person next to you very nicely. and Look at the person next to you very nicely. smile and tell them don't miss the shift. Turn to the person, another person and say don't miss the shift. Won't you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, we pray that you'll fall fresh on us now as we enter into thy word. Lord, I'm praying that you will speak to us and speak through me, stand in, stand in me as you always do. Empower me to be able to do what you want me to do at this time. But we really turn, the, this is your service. Have your way. This is your moment. There's someone here that needs a special word from you. We all need your word. But someone has to make a decision. Someone has, needs healing in their body. Someone needs encouragement. Someone needs an answer, direction, wisdom. Lord, speak now. Speak to us. Make your word clear. Help us understand it and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And what's the topic for today? Brothers and sisters, you know, life is filled with various shifts, different transi transitions or changes. Uh, and even in, in, in the Old Testament, Solomon says, to everything, there is a season. There are various changes in life. And sometimes we don't like to go through certain seasons, but we need to go through them. But I like what Bishop Paul Morton says, uh, Professor Berriman, he recorded a psalm that says, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, please don't do it without me. Don't do it without me. And brother, since I've come to the point in my life where I just want to go where God wants me to go, I want to do what he wants me to do, say what he wants me to say, if, if he's moving to the left, that's where I want to be. I want to be to the left. If he's moving to the right, I want to be to the right. If he says stand still, I want to stand still. I don't know about you. If he says turn around, guess what? I want to turn around. Whatever God is doing, I wish I had some help here this morning. Whatever God is doing, that's what I want to do. I want to be in the shift. I want to be where he's moving. Unfortunately, though, brothers and sisters, people miss things that are happening right in front of them. Even in churches across this nation, so many parishioners go in and out of church services without having any real encounter with the spirit of the living God. The word may go forth in truth, and it may go forth in power, and some people just sit up there just looking. Show me something. Prove something to me. You ain't done nothing yet. And God is speaking. They, they were praying about something all week. 
come to the house of God and if you pull up that shield and you ignore the fact that God is moving by his spirit, you'll miss what he's saying to you. Because your, the answer to your prayer may be in the worship service. But if you resist, you won't receive it. You know, I remember coming up, there was a, there was a I remember seeing a brother, older brother in our church. He used to, um, whenever the spirit got high in worship service, you know when people say spirit got high, you know what that means? You know when people just really start praising God? You know, like just a few minutes ago, we were saying, I love you, Jesus. You know, it looked like I could, we could just keep on singing that, you know. And the service, the spirit of the Lord would just move high. Some people, I remember, they start praising God and, and just clapping their hands. And I remember seeing this brother, and he was always busy doing worship service. When it got to that point, you know what he would do? He would walk right out of the church. You know why he walked out? Because he was fighting. He was resisting the spirit of God moving upon his life. He, he's like, this thing's getting too good. So he had to go outside, and he had to go and smoke a cigarette, and then come back inside. After everything is sort of settled down, then he come back in, then he's all right. A lot of people do that today. You do know that, right? And they may not necessarily go physically outside, but they could be sitting right in the sanctuary and block out everything that God is saying and God is doing. You do know that the Spirit of the Lord is still alive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Lord still speaks. This morning, we are looking at what I'm calling a spiritual shift in revival. Have you ever been revived? Now we just came through revival, right? We had revival. How many of you had a wonderful time in our revival? Ooh, we had a wonderful time, right? Did the revival stop a couple of weeks ago in your life? It should still be going on. And there's a shift. And when there's revival, when God is moving, we need to be moving right along with it. Don't let, don't let, don't let uh, uh, people stop you from hearing and seeing what God is doing. Throughout history, revival always consisted of God's word and it consisted of his people. And in England, the Wesley brothers, John and Charles Wesley, they were key leaders during a period called the Great Awakening. And during the Great Awakening, so many great things happening. When people preached the word of God, people would sit there and listen and the spirit of God would move because they were receptive to what God was saying. The first recorded revival in history, though, is found in the book of Nehemiah. The first six chapters of Nehemiah focuses on the reconstruction or rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. The second half of the book of Nehemiah, it covers the reinstruction of the people that built the wall. So in other words, God uses Nehemiah to rebuild the walls on the outside of the city. Then God raises up Ezra to come in and to pour in the word of God to rebuild the lives of the people. See, it doesn't make sense to look good on the outside and you tore up from the floor up on the inside. You got to have... Your, your inner man, our inner man, needs to be rebuilt. It needs to be strengthened. Now, if we know, just look at the, this, uh, this passage here in Nehemiah chapter 8. I just want to look at verses 1 to 2. Just a quick observation here. And the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both the men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. I'd like you just to, to look at this here. This first thing which happens so very subtly is what I'm calling a leader shift. A leader shift. In other words, there was a, it's like a delegation of leadership because up to this point in the book, Nehemiah is the main person. He's the main one. He starts off, we find out, he, oh, in, in the first chapter, you find he is the man who's the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Then as you keep reading, you find that he now becomes the project manager. He's helping the people rebuild the wall. And then he becomes the governor. But now, it seems as though you don't even hear his name as much. He, it's like he steps aside, you know, a little bit, and he allows Ezra to come in and to do his thing. Now, since Nehemiah was a man of prayer and humility, he knew when 
and how to step aside without feeling insecure. Because you do know that some people, they don't know how to step aside. Because they feel like if somebody else is doing it, then what do they have to do? But when you, are, when you are secure in God and you know who you are, you don't have to worry about a thing. You just keep on serving God. And as I often say, there will always be somebody better than us. God will always raise up somebody to do what he wants to do. Now, from this example, though, we learn from Nehemiah, we learn how to stay in our lane. That's a good way to put it. Stay in our lane. Now, it doesn't make sense for me to sit up here and tell you I can paint like somebody else, that I can be the plumber like somebody, because I can't do it. I'll try. I may do it. I'll, I'll make it look all right, you know. <laughs> the back say you can fake it, you know. <laughs> But, but if that's not my area of expertise, if I know that my sister, my brother, my left and my right can do it better than me, guess what? Let them do it. Then we all celebrate. We all look good. You, you know what I'm saying? Um, it even reminds me, too, of a passage regarding John the Baptist. John the Baptist, when Jesus officially began his ministry, in the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 27, John the Baptist says, he it is who coming after me is preferred before me whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. See, in other words, John the Baptist came, he baptized, he preached the word of God, he did what he had to do, but when Jesus came on the scene, you know what he did? Slide to the left. No, no, he didn't say that. Yeah, see, see, see. Uh-huh, uh-huh, see? see uh-huh, uh yeah, I see where you're going now, see? see, see they, they understood that. I said, slide to the right, you know. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> It's full of they like that, so, you know. But, but see, 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 he knew, John the Baptist knew how to step aside and allow Jesus to come and to do what he had to do. He baptized, preached the gospel, and now Jesus is on the scene. In our text, we see that Nehemiah trusts Ezra, who is better equipped to handle the assignment of sharing the word of God with the people of God. And I find it's always wise to surround ourselves with others whom God has gifted in areas we may not be as strong in to accomplish the project. Y'all with me? Yes. All right. Now listen, we want to look at a few movements of the shift. Can you say that? Movements yes. of the shift. Let's look at a few. The first one is found in verses 2 and 3. Let me read that very quickly. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, from the morning until midday, before the men and the women, and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. The first movement of the shift is proclamation. Can you say that with me? Proclamation, proclaiming. There is now what we see, they rebuild the walls. Now Ezra comes on the scene because Nehemiah says, hey, listen, we need the word. He comes and he presents the word of God. The scripture was proclaimed. And the first major move of revival begins with proclamation of the word of God. Are y'all with me? Yes. Note, they, note the fact that Ezra brought the book of the law and he read it. Note also the respect that is given. Look at, look, look, look at this. I hope, you, I hope you, didn't, you didn't miss this, but where it says, he read therein, in verse 3, before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Oh, my. Some of y'all are ready to go eat dinner right now. Or the football game, what do? But 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 the, the point is, <coughs> Nehemiah moves off the scene a little bit. He just steps aside, lets Ezra come. He presents the word of God, and the people stood from morning until when midday. And we some of us don't want to sit for half an hour, but they stood listening. To the word of God. 
look at look look at how they just attended. They just poured their attention to the word of the law because there was what? Proclamation. That's what happens when you listen to the word of God. There's proclamation. The people listened attentively and they stood for hours just to hear the word of the law. I wonder what would happen if we today would begin to focus and really listen to the word of the law. What is God saying? So there's proclamation. That's one movement of the shift. You know what another one is? The second one is expectation. Can you say expectation? expectation. There's proclamation and there is expectation. And I read it in verse 3. Notice, the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive under the book of the law. The people of God were hungry for the word of God. Too many people come to church today with crazy expectations. They're expecting to meet a man, expecting to meet a lady, expecting to get in position of power, expecting somebody to pat them on the back every time they do something, expecting, expecting other things. I'm not saying you can't expect those things in the house of God. But when that becomes the priority and the only reason why you're coming and you're not coming to expect the word of God, what have we come to do? The Bible says we are to desire the sincere milk of the word. They come with what the New Testament calls having itching ears. That is desiring to hear anything without filtering truth from lies. There's some people that would rather hear high pre preachers instead of holy preachers. They want to hear hype. They want to they wanna hear fluff and stuff. Make them happy. That's what they want to hear. But they don't want to hear anything that's going to bring change. Many people don't want to hear the word and allow it to get into their lives and cause them to say, what must I do to be saved? Some people who already know Christ, they come to church, but they don't want to move from where they are to improve in their life. They're just comfortable the way it is. If you just keep talking soft, Pastor, just let us relax just a little bit. Be calm. Not that God can't speak in the quiet moments. But some people come and they don't have that expectation and they're looking for what sounds good. They're looking for the latest cliches and messages that tickle the air without touching the soul. Something that sounds good, but is it really ministering unto your soul? You know, there are those that attend certain churches because the word presented, it never challenges them or brings conviction to improve. Some people specifically go to church. I just want to go to church just to, just to say that they went to church. It becomes a religious duty. But when you really come with expectation, saying, Lord, if you don't speak, I can't make it. If I don't have a word from you, I won't know what to do. If you don't show up and show out, I might lose my mind. When you get to that point where you're really hungry for something, you know how babies, you, have you, you know, mothers that, that, that breastfeed their babies, at some point there's this thing, this technique, what is called latching, where they're, they, they want the baby to learn how to latch onto the mother's breast. And then they start sucking. They're looking for that milk because it sustains them. That's the way it is when we, should, when we come to the house of God. There should be something in you crying out saying, Lord, I want your word. Lord, I want more of you. Nobody should have to pump and prime you when you come into the house of God. When you get into the house of God, you should say hallelujah anyhow. Because you know that if it had not been for the Lord on your side anyway, you wouldn't even be here. So when you come in, come in expecting. Come in looking to worship God, but also in your worship, our worship, we should have a level of expectation. By the way, you don't need to be in the house of God. Let me throw this out there. You don't need to be in the house of God to worship God. You don't need to be in the house of God to hear me bring the word. You can open the Bible yourself and allow God to speak to you through his word. The people in Nehemiah's time and Ezra's time, they were expecting. They came and they stood. 
Because you got to understand, God, what he did was, he allowed Ezra to come on the scene even before Nehemiah did. Now, Ezra comes on the scene and he helps Jerusalem rebuild the temple. They rebuild the temple or the synagogue. Then God raised up Nehemiah to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem to protect, right? Now God brings Ezra back onto the scene to bring the word, to bring life to the people. So you see, whether you're coming in a church house or you're in your own house, the bottom line is get the word. Tell somebody to get the word of God. And expect, expect God to do something. You know, I, I love expecting God to do something. It's something about it because it shows that, that, that I, it shows that one really has, you, we have faith and we have trust and we have a relationship with God. Lord, I expect you to do something. Sometimes I remember coming to church and if it didn't get me through the word that was preached, it was through a song. Sometimes the choir would sing a song and the word of God is in the song. And God specifically tailor made that song just for me. Amen? Somebody ought to give the Lord praise in the house. Amen? Just a little footnote here. If you look at verse 4, I'm just going to read the first part of the first portion of that. And Ezra the scribe, look what he did. He stood upon a pulpit of wood. Now, for those of you who are not aware of this, that's the history, this is part of the history or the foundational thinking of how worship structure was put in place. Nehemiah stood on the pulpit of wood, and if you look at verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Did y'all see that in the Bible? So in other words, they had the pulpit established, he gets up, he presents the word, he's above the people, and then all the people stood up. So, so you see, that's why you hear many pastors and preachers say, won't you stand in respect? or reverence for the word of God, because there was something about standing. When you heard the word of God, you didn't just sit there chewing your gum and just crossing your legs and like it's so. God is saying something. So everybody stood up. They wanted to hear. But you know, we've come as a nation, we've gotten so complacent, we don't want to hear nothing about the Bible. If you want to hear something about the Bible, we want to debate about something. We want to get something that's so controversial so that we can have nice philosophical discussion. That sounds good, but have you been changed? Are you looking for God and expecting God's word to strengthen you? I don't know about you, but I am. I'm looking for God's word to make a change in my life. So the people of God, they stood and they listened to the word of God. So the first thing we said was what? Proclamation. Secondly, we said what? Expectation. And thirdly, there is something called explanation. Explanation. In verse 7, drop down there. I'll just read 7. I'll call it part B, the latter portion. There are Levites that are here. And it says that the Levites cause the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. Look at verse eight. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. Is that clear for everybody? All that heard understood because the word was explained. See, Nehemiah and Ezra, they wanted, to, they wanted the, the walls rebuilt.